1994. I seem to mention this year a lot for some reason. It's not by choice, it just seems to turn out that way. Now, we've all seen my Pentium 66 quite a few times, and it's changed since it first appeared, but, well, we've sort of followed it through that. And you've seen everybody else's machines too, I'm sure. But there's an inherent inaccuracy that almost every channel like mine suffers from. Yes, this machine is not accurate. Subjected to even the most half-hearted research, the idea falls apart quickly that this is the authentic experience of a machine from that time. Sure, it could have existed, there may have been machines like it, but you probably wouldn't have seen them, much less owned or used one yourself, because this system alone would probably have fetched in over $10,000 if you wanted to buy it at that time. Oh, in case you're wondering, that's around $16,650 right at the end of 2017. Of course, it's not worth that much anymore, or I wouldn't have it here, but it still has put serious holes in my wallet just to get it at all. But hell, do you think I'd be here if I had $16,000 in my pocket? Yeah, I think I'd probably be touring America in muscle cars or something by now. Still, there were plenty of other machines you could have bought back then, and they were still capable enough in the right hands. You'll see it in magazines and books from the time. There are very few machines out there which have configurations even resembling my Pentium. And, well, there's no wonder. As we said, they're very expensive, and it's a bit of a niche market still having something that fast. And you're probably even harder pressed to find Pentium 90s as those did exist at the time. So, now let me introduce you to something a little bit more realistic. This is a 486SX made by Unichip. Yeah, they're not exactly a big name, but if you want to buy one of those, that's going to ramp the price up, and so you probably want to avoid the big name systems. But doing this, you're really taking a risk, because the quality varies greatly right now. These things haven't quite settled down. Still, this one has a rather nice chassis, but already you can see it's far more modest than my Pentium 66. No CD-ROM drive is included, you'd have to buy that separately. The OEM or the distributor might have fitted one for you, but the cost would have likely been getting on towards $1,000 for a 4-speed drive, because those were new at the time, so you'd have likely gone for something slower if you even bothered, and let's face it, if you didn't need the drive, you weren't going to buy one. It's much like today, I know plenty of people who don't own optical drives anymore because, well, now they've gone out of fashion and at the time they weren't quite really in fashion yet. They were getting there rapidly, but you could still get away with it for the time being. This system, though, is in fact quite bare and utilitarian because turning it around, you can definitely see there's no sound card installed. Sound cards are also quite costly, Probably around $200 for a Sound Blaster 16, if not more. So if you did install a card, well, it would probably be a clone. You'd better hope it has Sound Blaster compatibility, because that's pretty much what everything was going for. And yeah, Sound Blaster, not Sound Blaster Pro or Sound Blaster 16. Almost no cards are Sound Blaster 16 compatible, and, well, Sound Blaster Pro compatibility, yeah, not all of them can do that, so... You might be listening to things in 8-bit mono a lot of the time, which is fine, it's better than no sound at all, it's perfectly acceptable. You might have bought the sound card as a bundle with a CD-ROM drive to save a little bit of the cost if you wanted one of those too. These used to be called multimedia kits, and the CD-ROM drive has an interface provided by the sound card. There are various interfaces from different manufacturers, and they're not interchangeable. They're completely incompatible with one another, and yeah, it's not always entirely obvious. For example, the drive I'm showing here is a Sony, but it doesn't use the Sony interface on this card. If we take off the lid, you will see we truly are on the bare basics here. There's a Hurst adapter with common I.O. on the ISA bus. A rather plain Realtek VGA card with 256k RAM is also installed. Hey, the ET4000 was probably something you could only dream about earning because it cost quite a lot of money and RAM was very expensive at the time, so you're only going to upgrade from that 256k if you really need to. 
that does it for the cards. Strangely, Unichip actually used a VLB motherboard in this case, but you can't use the slots because this chassis makes use of a riser, and that's the only thing you can install cards on. I don't know if it was deliberate crippling of the system, or maybe it was that they simply made this later on in the 486's life, and it might have been cheaper just to manufacture one type of motherboard and use it across all the different systems. I can't really be certain, but the VLB slots themselves require very little in the way of additional logic and circuitry, so it probably doesn't incur much of a cost penalty. It was the cards themselves that would have driven up the cost of a system. The, the VLB cards are where the price would be. The actual VLB slots and the interface itself was quite cheap to implement, and it was one of the reasons it was successful. In fact, it had to be because it was devised as a stopgap until PCI arrived. It had a real lifespan of less than a year planned for it, and so to make it work, they had to make it cheap. Still, as such, this system is definitely stuck using only the ISA bus, as were a good number from its time. Even though machines today still show up that have usable VLB slots, but the slots have never been used because the owner couldn't afford the faster VLB cards at the time the system was in use. RAM is included in the deal, probably. You might have to select how much you want, depending on where you buy it from. You do get 4 megabytes in the case of this one, and yeah, that should be enough, right? You can go further, maybe upgrade to 8 megs if you're lucky, and you can think of a good enough reason to justify it. You'll probably just end up using half of it as a RAM drive if that were the case, though. Not many applications really needed that yet. Cash was also included if you wanted it, 128k in write-through mode. This motherboard actually does support write-back mode, so that was starting to be a thing, but a lot of them didn't really do that yet. A lot of systems were still using older board designs that could only do write-through mode, so we'll just say that's what we've got here. It's more than you're going to need with 4 or 8 megs of RAM anyway, so this should be enough. And even then, if your board did support right back mode, you might have put it in right through mode if you had more RAM as well. The cache is expensive and you've got to make back that cost somewhere. Memory used to cost hundreds of dollars back then. And in fact, in large installations, it could have cost thousands, but, well, we're not really approaching that here. A hard drive is also included, but it would be a few hundred megabytes at best. In this case, we'll say maybe 170 to 240 megabytes would be the average for a system like this. It'll get you there, but it's not really going to be fast. I don't actually have a drive that small anymore, so we'll just have to pretend this one's smaller than it really is, because this is actually just over a gigabyte, but we'll say it's about 170 megabytes. You made a wise choice with that 25MHz 486SX CPU because nobody's using the FPU yet outside of some professional applications and you might have been able to get the SX significantly cheaper. Seems to vary from month to month. But on the other hand, home computers weren't quite as widespread yet, so there's a good chance of the system being used for business purposes. It should be fine as long as you don't want your CAD designs finished by this afternoon. Still, you can upgrade it to a 66 MHz DX2 later on, and maybe even a little bit faster than that. Hey, Cyrix made a DX280, and, well, this motherboard does have a 40 MHz clock option, so depending on what you're doing, that may be a better upgrade path. This thing does have upgrade options. You would certainly be able to take this machine up to the point of being a passable Windows 95 rig in its later life. It would be even better if we had access to the VLB slots, but maybe it would be better just to leave this machine alone with the specs that it's at, and to wait out Socket 5's maturity leading into Socket 7 in the coming years, and then maybe move to another system if we need more power then. I also think we're just sitting at the point where buying a 386DX40 or a 486DLC would be a bit of an unwise investment. It's not really got much more mileage left in that platform now. So that's it. That's all you're getting. No, I mean it. You bought the machine. You, you can't do anything with it because you still need a monitor and human interface devices like the keyboard. Monitors are quite expensive. A few hundred dollars and they're also really heavy. So either you're going to have to get it home yourself and screw up your spine for the rest of your life or pay for a delivery man to carry it and bust his back instead. 
I sure hope it arrives in one piece if you do that. Now, if you're really stuck for cash by this point, you might be able to get a monochrome one for less if you don't need colour. Of course, that is going to be a thing. You're never going to have colour on this monochrome monitor, so you're going to have to think seriously about this for a while before actually paying for something. Shop around then and you might be lucky and get a system like this running for between six and eight hundred dollars. It's not something the average working class family is about to go out and impulse buy. Of course, you're still going to have to buy an operating system to actually run the thing, but, well, if you owned a machine before, you might have made do with your existing operating system discs and installed whatever you had in there. In fact, if you built the system yourself, I'd be willing to bet that you would just carry over a lot more than the operating system from your old PC. You'd have probably taken your video card, if only temporarily, you'd also transplanted the hard drive and floppy drive and anything you could salvage onto the new system. You'd have been using the same old keyboard, the same old monitor if you could. You'd have just done everything you could just to save the costs. Overall, building it yourself would have been better in some respects, in that you'd have more control over what went in, especially if you did have parts to reuse. The getting hold of new stuff wasn't always easy. First, you had to actually find somewhere that supplied it in your area. It's not like you could just go on the internet and order it, and so there's a good chance the supplier might try to screw you over with inflated prices and crap hardware, because, let's face it, what are you going to do about it? Is the only guy in town who can get this stuff. Where are you going to go? The machine runs DOS. Version 6.22 did arrive in 1994, but there's every possibility you would still be using version 5 or earlier, even if you bought it from an OEM that installed an operating system. And that's it. Nothing special, no Windows. That, that wasn't part of the deal, and if you didn't need it, you didn't buy it. You might have used the front end for DOS like Commander, though, and hey, those things do work if you really want them. Besides, Windows really benefits from using a mouse, and that didn't come with the machine, and it would use up the COM port that you have, and you might need that for something else. Also, Windows is going to stretch the available RAM much more than running plain DOS. In fact, to use some of the features for Windows for Workgroups 3.11, it does recommend more RAM than we really have to hand here. I mean, sure, you could get away with it, but it's not going to be very pretty. I don't think it'd run very fast with more than just a couple of Windows open. Performance-wise, the machine really isn't that fast anyway, and I feel cruel for comparing it to my Pentium, and bear in mind, the socket for Pentium would actually be getting a little bit old now. Yeah, that platform's only been there for a year, but Intel's already moving to make socket 5 blow it out of the water, and that Pentium 90 and the Pentium 75 are they're going to sell quite well in the coming months. Now, every test I run is going to come in with just a completely unfair performance gap. The much more luxurious 5th generation system is just going to streak ahead invariably, and we're not going to be able to do anything to catch it here. Now sure, this little 486SX can do most of the same stuff in reality, but it's not going to do it anywhere near as quickly or as well. Well, as well, eh, it'll certainly do it, it won't fail, I, there's no reason it should just randomly break down, but you're not going to have as much fun, in all likelihood, if it's something that you need doing in a to a deadline, so, yeah. You are stuck with an outdated congested bus, a rather slow IDE hard drive, and only floppy disks to get files in and out of the machine, unless you can use Laplink somehow, but the odds of been there another system with it after you just shelled out for this one are quite slim. I don't think you're going to own a laptop right now. Not unless you're some super rich businessman, and then, well, why are you going to own a Poxy 486SX? You could have bought a Pentium 90 or something. Network cards are, of course, a big no-no. After all, what are you going to plug it into? Nobody has home networks yet. The internet doesn't run on DSL and have a router to hand that you can jack it into, and even then, you haven't got another machine sat on the network, so... Yeah, this would just be a pointless peripheral to average Joe at the time. It would have had absolutely nothing to do with it. A completely needless expense. I feel it's only right for me to elaborate just a little bit and say that as we're stuck with DOS, 
networking functionality isn't actually included with the operating system yet. Now obviously we could use Windows for work groups but we already established we probably don't need that and using it just for networking at the time well it's a bit of a needless cost and to be honest networking's a bit of a headache in general right now. You'll notice this card has a yes it works with network sticker on top of the chip though. It's a real tech network card this and well yes it does work with network and it does work with windows and probably works with microsoft land manager but there's the thing those things don't work with each other so it could be a few headaches down the road also with dos not having this functionality you're going to have to obtain software to do that separately could be quite expensive meanwhile lap link cables they're relatively cheap almost all machines have serial and parallel ports so really you're good to go on those and that's what people did when floppy disks weren't a viable option uh, anyway I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves I mean you don't own a computer yet to go on the internet with and well not many people have the internet in 1994 so yeah I think we're kinda stuck there we'll have to go with ordering from that distributor or find a store that sells this stuff it's gonna be our only option Still, this machine will run the hell out of WordPerfect. It will run Doom, but you're not going to be going flat out with the detail and screen size, I don't think. Largely because this Realtek video card's so slow. To be honest, these Realtek cards are not that good. You would have done better to have almost any other brand in there. But, well, that's what this one came with, so that's what we're using. It was look at the draw. They often didn't specify what make you were getting. And even then, it might have varied depending on which batch of systems the distributor had at the time, they might not have known themselves. Still, you've had it a while now, so why not get a multimedia kit and have some sound and optical media? It would be nice, but again, if you didn't need it, you weren't going to buy it. This is an Opti929 sound card, and these are my go-to when a sound blaster isn't around. To be honest, they work really well, though some games seem to dislike them if they're not set to IRQ7, so you'd better hope it isn't in use at the same time as your printer port, or you'll be in trouble. But as DOS doesn't really do multitasking, that's not likely to come up. Yeah, you shouldn't share interrupts if you can help it, but you'll probably get away with this one. They're not bad cards, and some of them even feature genuine Yamaha FM chips. Others have chips like the LS212, which is practically indistinguishable, and the Sound Blaster or Windows Sound System compatibility is pretty good overall. Of course, you might not have been so lucky, and your clone card might have been terrible. The quality from one solution to another varies very broadly, and some of them were just almost useless. Of course, it goes without saying that the prices for these peripherals also varies broadly, but they're going to set you back a fair amount. If you're a business user, you might instead have invested in a tape drive for backups, should the machine be tasked with anything important enough that you don't want to rely solely on the hard drive. Unfortunately, I can't show this thing in action, but it's a fairly standard procedure. It has its own host adapter card that I seem to have locked away somewhere safe right now, and a 5.25 inch drive. Now as far as I know that 50 pin interface isn't scuzzy at all, it's proprietary to these Maynard drives. I don't have any software to run it so unfortunately we just won't be able to play with it and I definitely don't have any tapes to hand. This was actually in the system when I got it. Towards the end of its life, things would have been getting a little bit rough though. You'd be forever trying to clear up space on that hard drive. There would have been a stack of floppy diskettes next to it as high as your house, and all of those flashy new games wouldn't really run that well anymore. Quake definitely isn't going to happen, and all of the Windows games need much more capable video cards, let alone more RAM and CPU power. Your friends probably didn't laugh at you though, because, well, they probably didn't have a PC yet themselves, so, well, yeah, they can't really make fun of you in this case. I wouldn't want to be riding this thing far past 1996, though. It would be getting a little bit uncomfortable by then. On the other hand, you'd probably be okay with it for a little while longer in an office or a business environment where the software doesn't change very often. You can still get all your documents and databases done, the same as you ever could before. They're just going to be a bit slower compared to your rival company across the street that moved to some new Windows NT machines just last week. So you might have to think about taking an upgrade path soon. 
Either way, I suspect the ones used in the business environment still aren't going to have CD-ROM drives or optical drives. Most of them didn't, and you still saw quite a few of them like that that were still in service in the early 2000s. In fact, this machine that we're looking at here only came out of service just over a year ago, so... Yeah, they never bothered putting those things in, because you just didn't need it. Now, it might be worth noting that going forwards just a little ways, to 1997, I got my first system, which was a 25 MHz 3H6, and that ran until around 2001. It too lacked a sound card and CD-ROM drive, so I guess this one is almost a first-hand story in a way. There is one thing I guarantee you, if you built this thing yourself, something in here is going to end up in that Socket 7 machine you're saving up to build. I'm absolutely sure of it. And that multimedia kit? Yeah, that's going in there. That external modem? Yeah, I think we'll keep that. The human interfaces? Yeah, we'll have those, and hell, we'll have that floppy drive because we'll need that to get all the stuff back from the floppies we saved things for later on whenever we needed to uh, clear space on that puny 170 megabyte hard drive. You unwitting fool, the AMD Athlon is only two years away. Now, if you didn't live it, you might not be able to see why it was such a big leap, or appeared to be so at the time. A lot of younger enthusiasts really seem to prefer the Pentium 4, and even some older people do. Some seem to think it was just an incremental upgrade over the Pentium 3 and something to be expected. Well, now maybe you can see why the Athlon was such a big deal. It brought high-end performance down into a price range where you or I might feasibly be able to earn one before it was completely obsolete. Even a Duron would have been a, a massive step forwards. Until then, the lower price range had really been taken up with the aging Pentium MX that had practically no upgrade path at all, questionable Celeron machines with deliberately narrow upgrade paths and crippled motherboards, and the somewhat lacking Cyrix M2, and even the K62, the latter of which was only released in 1998, and whilst it was a very good processor, this was barely over a year before the K7 arrived. Even then, you'd be amazed how many 486-era machines were still in service due to the cost alone. The seventh generation really changed that. It gave you a guaranteed upgrade path for the CPU if you started out on a lower end model. The boards almost always had an AGP port. They almost always supported more than enough RAM. In just a few short years, five to be exact, you've come a long way from that humble 25 MHz 486 SX. Hell, I know I've told it before, I've told it a million times. Imagine what it was like for me in 2001, moving from that 386 to a Duron 750. It was night and day, but somehow you never quite forget that slow, rather limited, yet somehow dependable machine you started out on all those years ago. Someday we'll all be gone and future generations will never know what it was like. These days, they always seem to have the latest smartphone practically at launch. They've got the best 4K TVs in their own room. It's not the family's TV, and it's not the family's hand-me-down black and white one. But maybe now they'll know it wasn't always that way. That when people like you or I started out, this was often all we had, and we were grateful just to earn one at all. 25 megahertz and 4 megabytes of RAM... That was good enough, it was a lot better than nothing. So, this was my way of clearing the air. This is something I've wanted to do for quite a while, just to set the record straight. This is what you really had. It wasn't glamorous, it didn't really stand out, and it didn't do anything to set it apart from the rest. But it was all you could get, and you made do with it. You found a way to make it work. Hell, you're going to tell me I can't play Duke Nukem 3D on this thing because it wants a DX266? Like hell it does, I'll just run it anywhere. I'll turn the detail down, I'll play it without sound if I have to. I'll shrink the screen, I'll beat the boss keyboard only with the sunlight bleaching out my monitor in the middle of summer, and I'll try to label my floppies properly for when I want to find those documents I had to put on them to fit the game on my hard drive. Ah. Oh, I need a floating point unit for my spreadsheets to go faster? Well, guess what? I'll just wait for the slower internal emulation in the processor to do it. How's that? 
I need more VGA RAM to use higher colour modes. Well, I guess we'll just use low resolution 8 bit modes then. You can document your flashy hardware, and so will I, but never forget, it isn't the true story. It wasn't the way things were for most of us. Nobody cared whether you had the latest hardware because they didn't have it either. They couldn't have it. Nobody cared what numbers appeared under your stupid name on the internet, and we slogged through it all on severely crippled systems that often didn't work that well, and you didn't really think about things like 60 frames per second or 4K resolution. We were just glad if it ran at all without crashing, because nobody could ever really be bothered to set interrupts properly if they even knew what they were or how they worked. It used to feel like an event every time you got something new installed and saw it run for the first time. Or the first time you heard the strange noises your modem made when it talked to a distant computer at the other end of a telephone line. It was like embarking on an exciting journey into the unknown, into the future. If only we'd known back then where it might take us.